Greetings, this is Jay Michaels, and we're here at Boston Sci-Fi. Uh, thrilled to be here with uh, an astonishingly intelligent group of people on a particular topic. Um, science fiction and horror. Uh, well, let's say science seems to, uh, seems to go in one direction, and I think it needs to be addressed cylindrically. We tend to look out on the stars and figure out how to get there. We tend to look at something and figure out how to get in there, get on there, get within. But something tells me we're wrong. Something tells me those stars have previously went and found us. Something tells me those myths and folklores and legends that we think are, as the expression goes, old tales, might have some basis of fact. Maybe there's something that that happened long before our knowledge. Maybe the things we're going to get have already gotten us. We're here with uh, we're here with Kate Dolan and Connor McMahon. They are filmmakers in this year's Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival, and they have some films that we're going to chat with them about. And we're here with two guests, Bill Oberst Jr. Um, I've affectionately called him the Boris Karloff of the 21st century because his level of work, his level of expertise, his level of passion in front of the camera and on stage, which I've seen very recently, has made him truly that kind of caliber within the genre. And if you've seen his one man show, it's that caliber in any genre. And we are here with Dr. Chris McCauley. Dr. McCauley's name has been connected to everything from Star Trek to Doctor Who. His writings, his screenplays, his work in general, in every industry, in games, in films, in novels, in television and beyond, uh, is award-worthy and award-winning. And the, the knowledge that he brings is quite incredible. He is currently scripting a new, a new Dracula comic and before we think, okay, great, another Dracula, this one contains works never heard before from the diaries of Bram Stoker, not Jonathan Harker, but from the diaries themselves of Bram Stoker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to meet you here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's, let's go around very quickly and uh, uh, beyond my gush, Tell us a little about yourselves. Uh, ladies first, <laughs> Dolan, uh, your film, You Are Not My Mother, there's an, an, an enigmatic title. Uh, tell us all about it and you. Yeah, um, so I am a horror filmmaker from Dublin, Ireland. Um, you Are Not My Mother is my debut feature film. Um, and I have made some shorts previously and music videos, commercials, that kind of stuff in Ireland. Um, but You Are Not My Mother is my first feature film. And we premiered at TIFF Midnight Madness in September. And we recently just played at a French film festival over the weekend where we actually won a jury prize for the film, um, which is Festival de Gerard May and it's a fantasy genre film festival. And we're screening at Boston Sci-Fi in like a week or two. Um, and I'm feeling very excited about that. And um, yeah, I think, you know, the film is very much rooted in Irish folklore as well. So I'm excited to talk to you guys today a bit, a bit about that and uh, how it inspired the film and uh, my interest in the folk tales of Ireland and folk history. Did, uh, did your, your interest in folk tales come first or did the making of the film come first? Some people, they make a film and they say, oh, I didn't realize it. And suddenly they, they, they have a brand new field of study. Uh, did did your love of Irish folklore come first? Yeah, I think as an Irish person, you're kind of surrounded by folklore from an early age. You're told all the stories and all the kind of superstitions and myths and legends are very much part of your upbringing. So it, I've always been fascinated by some of the stories um, in our history. And uh, I think it just intensified my love of folklore uh, doing the research for the film. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot more than I knew before. Terrific, terrific. I long to hear more about it. Your, your title alone was enigmatic enough. <laughs> uh, uh, Connor McMahon, please tell yep. us about you and your film. Sure. Um, well, I'm also an Irish filmmaker from Dublin um, uh, in the horror genre. And um, yeah, this is my fourth feature film. Um, 
And uh, this one is a, a vampire comedy uh, based in very much set in Dublin. Um, Cause I'd made a lot of horrors before and I always ended up in the countryside and just because you're isolated and, and, and I, I, I always wanted to do one that was best around the area I grew up and, and so it was actually a real pleasure to write this one and, uh, you know, be able to reference my own environment in that way. Um, and then in terms of folklore, I, I've also, aside from the vampire mythology, um, you know, I have made shorts about the Banshee and, and, and like Kate says, as an Irish person, it's always interesting because the, the, the folk tales you're brought up on, they're told to you as if they're true. They're not, it's not like some kind of story that's, that's like, and, and you kind of believe them. It's, it's like, even if you don't, you don't want to tempt fate either. So you do have this sense in Ireland that it's, they're not just stories. You're so smart. You, you actually gave me an idea for a question, which I'll give later. Um, <laughs> vampire film. How did you get, how did you, how do you marinate vampires with Irish folklore? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's sort of images from folklore that I always try and pull into my film. So for example, we have a mytholo myth mythological hero called Cú Cullen over here. And there's a, there's a, a famous scene in that story where he's, as a young boy, he, his name is Satanta and he's arriving at this king's feast. And, and the guard dog comes running out at him and he uses his hurley stick and a slitter, which is the ball, and he, and he slays the hound. And it's supposed to be symbolic of facing your fears and just using whatever you have available to you to defeat the monster. And then he also, he then becomes the guard, the guard for the castle. He takes the place of the hound. And that's what that name Ku Cullen means. It's the hound of Cullen. And, so I always I always try to use this as a transformative moment in so even in the vampire film he slays a vampire you know with the hurley stick and 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 pulls the heart out ah. and wallops the heart so it's so it's it's, a, it's an image I I I try and pull these images from mythology and somehow they they always have a power in them you know uh, I think we have to put a spoiler alert now uh, <laughs> for your film. Uh, everyone ignore that just see the film anyway. uh, it's one of many deaths <laughs> oh okay i feel much better uh dr mccauley uh i have read some of your work and and we've had many conversations at length and i know that your films are rich in imagination your stories are deep with legends and other such uh such materials uh, what's going on with you? What's what's new? Tell us how folklore comes into your work. Well, I suppose primarily it's the Dracula uh, stuff that I'm doing with uh, Decker Stoker. He's the great grand nephew of Bram Stoker. So we've been looking at um, Bram's notes uh, and diary extracts, um, looking at how Dracula was influenced by Irish mythology. Uh, I'm going to butcher the Celtic name, but there was an Irish vampire called Abertach. Um, and we also have bog vampires as well in Ireland, which are older. It's one of the oldest uh, forms of, of vampire. Uh, we believe that Bram was told these tales by his nanny, who was quite a mysterious character. Bram was very ill as a young man, and his nanny administered uh, special treatment to him, which may have linked to uh, what... And I hate using the term brides, but it's the common parlance. The the brides of Dracula, the, the ladies who reside in Dracula's castle, uh, due to Jonathan Harker. So there's some interesting um, aspects linking Dracula to Irish folklore and folklore in general. Um, and then working with, uh, you know, in, in the sci-fi realms, I look at uh, post-apocalyptic, I, I term it as post-apocalyptic folklore, the fear of nuclear holocaust. Uh, especially in uh, Asian uh, countries. And, you know, that kind of ties into my work on the uh, Terminator, um, which, uh, yeah, I've been working on the official Terminator RPG game. Um, so that's been that's been fun. So I've been peppering that with full of this, all these uh, apocalyptic folklore that's kind of arisen since the 50s. Wow, that, that's... Uh, it, it's so funny you say that. I, I was talking to an actor, I, ironically, in Ireland, 
uh, I'm I'm doing a, a virtual reading of of Orson Welles' script of Dracula from uh, uh, the Mercury Theatre, and uh, the one comment my Jonathan Harker, who who is in Ireland, said was, "Well, you you need it. You need an Irishman in this," and I guess he understood the same uh, the same vampire legends that you do. Uh, really interesting. I had no idea. You, you you just taught me something. There you go. That was great. Uh, uh, Mr. Oberst, uh, I have seen I have seen your performances in so many uh, in so many different places in film, and I saw it live. Uh, and we have also chatted at length. And and your your depth of logic in terms of performance is remarkable. Uh, I I have the feeling that you tap into folklore that you've studied this as well. Uh, share with us your thoughts uh, in terms of folklore within the genre. Every time I do one of these, Jay, after I hear what people are doing and saying, I think, what the hell am I doing here? And again, today, I think, what the hell am I doing? I have no idea, but I'm glad to be here. I'm an actor. Um, I do things that my mother can't watch. Uh, I do cult uh, horror. I like extreme things. I like things that are offensive and provocative and therefore thoughtful. Uh, I, I really related to something that Condor said. I grew up in the American South. And um, much like uh, some parts of Europe, and as Connor was saying in Ireland, we grew up with mythology that was not presented to us as mythology. It was simply um, the other world that was just on the other side that you could sometimes see as through a mist. Uh, so I grew up in Spanish Oaks, uh, old, ruined, decayed properties, vast plantations, empty of everything except uh, mist of memory. So those are the environments that I grew up on. Uh, my sympathies have always been with the monster. I love monsters. And I'm very into the literary roots of both horror and sci-fi. Um, so I'm really, really glad to be here today to talk about this. Thank you for having me. Oh, oh, our pleasure. Uh, while we have you, I'm going to segue into, into our first question. And I'd like to, to focus it on your stage show, on your one-man show. Now, it's based on a Ray Bradbury short story, and one can call it horror and sci-fi. It's Ray Bradbury. Mm, there's, there's your sci-fi. But it's, it's about a corpse who, who comes back, essentially, the last corpse on Earth. So we have the horror element there. Please tell us about that. Well, it's, it's actually very tied to uh, folklore. This is, Ray wrote this when he was a young man. It's one of the first big things he wrote. I think he was 27 when he wrote it. Uh, he was angry as young men can be. <laughs> and that anger and that uh, um, sense of the poetic that the young have in their hunger is what fuels this. It's a story of a future society in which all morbidity has been done away with. No morbidity in books, no morbidity in ideas, certainly no corpses. So no graveyards. But they decide to leave one last graveyard as an exhibit, and it's in Salem, Massachusetts. And this story is set about 400 years after those events. And they're digging up this last, they don't want it anymore. And they're gonna burn him like they burn every, people who die in this world are immediately taken to the crematorium. No service, nothing, just boom, 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 back up to the sun. And he's the last dead man in the world and he's the last corpse they're digging up. And inexplicably he wakes up and he's really angry because there are no more like him in the world and all he wants is to make more friends, which of course <laughs> means more dead people. So he decides to reacquaint the world with darkness and superstition. And uh, of course it ends very badly for him and very poetically for him, but that's the whole point. The, the piece um, contains what I think is the great hymn to Halloween in which Ray Bradbury starts for the first time to rehearse all of these ideas he would later work out in all of his fiction about why he was so passionate about gothic horror. What's what's the the folkloric piece within that? When you say it's it's very folklore, where where might you place it in that sense? It's very Greek, um, very Greek. And I heard Ray talk about this in an interview. Um, the the uh, um, ubiquitousness, uh, at least for his generation of even sci-fi writers, like this is a super science from 1949. But you can see the cover there. It's absolutely um, Greek mythology. And 
Ray was certainly a part of that generation. I, I think that we have a mythological and folklorish underpinning of a lot, a lot of horror now. It's just that we're no longer a literary society and we don't recognize it. I'm so glad you said that. There, there are so many moments where I've said it to my students and I, I've seen it everywhere where something would happen and I might look and say, oh yes, that looks very much like the Medusa or, you know, oh, oh, that's Sisyphus or, or that's like the we people or anything like that where, where I'm talking mythology, where I'm talking ancients and, and I'm greeted with blank stares. You're absolutely right. I think we've, we've forgotten, we've forgotten uh, the foundation and, and, and like, like, like mistakes, we're doomed to repeat them if we don't understand them. Uh, Kate, tell us now, uh, you are not my mother. Uh, the first time I heard it, uh, Garen Daly, who is the executive director of Boston Sci-Fi, mentioned your film at a meeting. And he has a very distinctive, deep, gravelly voice. So to have this man suddenly say, yeah, we have a film in this. You are not my mother. <laughs> the title has always fascinated me. Tell us about your movie. Um, yeah, so You Are Not My Mother, it's it's very much rooted in Irish folklore. So um, when I was first, uh, it's, it, essentially it's a film about a teenage girl who um, her mother is suffering from mental illness and then uh, one day her mother goes missing and the family fear the worst. She lives with her um, m uh, maternal grandmother in the house as well. So her grandmother and herself are very worried about where the mother's gone and then she returns a day later and her behavior grows increasingly strange after her arrival home and the teenage girl realizes that the family has a past and a history with the other world or these kind of beings from the other world, which in, fair, in um, Irish folklore is fairies or on she. Um, and essentially her mother may not be uh, her mother after all, it might be something else. So. I won't spoil the ending, but it's uh, set all around the week of Halloween because in Ireland we have a great tradition of Halloween. It's a pa obviously a pagan holiday. Samhain is the, um, you know, the original pagan holiday, which is very much uh, rooted in Ireland. And the idea of Samhain was that on Halloween night, the veil between our world and the other world was extremely thin. So that's why people lit bonfires and left out treats to basically placate or scare away the um, other world or the creatures from the other world or spirits um, that may be visiting. So the film's set around Halloween and it's uh, the idea of the mother being not who she is is based very much on the changeling mythology, which is an Irish folklore, but it's also seen in Scandinavian folklore and uh, I think even in Spain and other parts of Europe as well, which is the idea that a fairy would come and leave a baby of their own in place of yours and they would take the human child with them to the other world so um yeah there's a lot of references to irish folklore in the movie as well like small ones to just like throughout the idea of the three women of different generations is kind of based around the three goddesses of celtic mythology the maiden the mother and the crone and there's a lot of things like that in the film which is which are referenced so it's kind of a little ode to all the Irish folklore, but similar to Connor, actually, it's set very much in Dublin, like in this, in the, not in the city, but the suburbs of the city, because I grew up there, but I, it didn't make the folk tales that I heard any less scary, or like my grandmothers were always kind of telling me these stories as if they're real, as Connor said, so it didn't matter that you weren't in a scary forest in a cabin in the woods, it was still very much part of your life, um, hearing all those kind of things, so. It's, it's interesting you say about modernization. Uh, I, I've seen this with a lot of, of Asian horror films. They take an ancient message, but they throw it in such a modern setting. Uh, there was one about a cursed cell phone that I saw. And then obviously The Ring, which is which was a, a haunted videotape and then a haunted computer in, in all the sequels. So so I guess the juxtaposition of, of modern and ancient, uh, you're right, it keeps it just as scary. You you bring up two very interesting terms. You bring up the term changeling, uh, which is which is similar to the, the thought of shapeshifter. And I think if you polled a vast group of horror and science fiction lovers, they all know those words. Some might know it as ancient, but others have seen it in how many science fiction films and movies and TV series and books and whatever. So yeah, you're right, it, it, it steps in there. Uh, 
it's it's one of the more popular ones. Uh, is that one that you're drawn to? Is that something that that you've always found most fascinating, or or uh, what what came first uh, in your writing this? Did you did you take the myth and decide to to do this, or as you're doing the movie, you said this myth fits? Which which came first? Well, I was I wanted to write a film that was about kind of coming of age with the parent of mental illness and how that how traumas in the past of the family come back and um, how to break out of that cycle. So when I was wanting to tell that story, I was obviously researching a lot of Irish folklore and the changeling myth seemed very, um, just the appropriate vehicle to tell that story because in Irish, in, in Irish life, in like the, you know, I think 1895 was the last case of it that was reported, but families would think that their family, family members were a changeling or, you know, were something that they shouldn't be. And there was a lot of tragic stories of people actually like burning their relatives in a fire or drowning their babies in a river. And uh, the last one I had read about was 1895, which was a woman called Bridget Cleary and she had the flu and her husband thought she was a changeling and uh, he burned her in a fire in their house. So it was one of those stories, they just felt like the story that I wanted to tell with the kind of um, family dealing with this mental illness and these past demons coming to get them. It just felt like the two kind of worked together really nicely. It was a short film about Bridget Cleary. I remember hearing that story and watching the film. Uh, it's really interesting, and and we're we're, we're talking about that that uh, for lack of a better word that witchcraft sort of feel that 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 demon inside of you feel. Um, uh, Bill in talking about his one man show, we uh, the irony that it's a, a cemetery in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, so again, we 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 see this witchcraftish feel in there. Uh, we who we who respect the pagan the pagan uh, uh, ideologies understand Samhain and all that goes with it. So, and that's that's a movement that's getting larger these days. So I have a feeling your your film is going to be uh, is going to be very attractive to many people. And <laughs> speaking of attractive, vampires are always the major uh, the major source of attraction. Connor, uh, tell us all about. It's a comedy. But tell us all about your vampire film. How uh, the the mythology in that? What would you what would you trace the mythology, the uh, the old world thinking from that? Is it is it the legend that you've mentioned, or is it goes deeper than that? Um, I would say just, just like it's probably like again marrying a modern idea with the old mythology and trying to find how those two things work. For me, the jumping off point for that film was I wanted to tell a story about a toxic codependent relationship and you know you, you do see it in Dracula with sort of Dracula and, and Renfield and it has this sort of um, and, and, and that was the crux of my story that I it was about it's about two brothers but one of them is a vampire and he's he's always been very um, uh, he's basically been using his his younger brother, and the the point in the film that I really wanted to to get across was the idea that the younger brother learns that it's not really the vampire's fault because the vampire is just a vampire, and and he's just doing what he's doing. It's really up to him. Like he's the one invited him in over the threshold. He's he's the one that you know is trying to find him blood, and so it's really he's the one that has to change himself so i was trying to use a lot of the familiar vampire ideas you could say um in terms of linking it to the mythology like one of the interesting things in one part of the film we actually filmed in a bram stoker's museum which is in clontarf which is where um bram stoker is from so there was something nice about going to that original location and and just having that sense of, um, you know, okay, we're in Ireland. This is where that famous mythology originated from, and and in some way following in some footsteps, I suppose. Um, but a lot of a lot of my mythology, because uh, is drawn from what we know, I would say, you know, and it's really the the modern element and that modern story, which was kind of putting a twist on it. 
That's interesting. So do you, do you, I, I won't say backwards, but I'll say, do you, do you take it from the other angle? Do you say, okay, this is, this is the story of codependence. This is the story of what I want to tell of today. Now, where is the mythology within that? Do you, do you look at the modern, uh, and, and this is the question I'm going to ask everybody later, the, the modern reality and see where it has mythological or, or folkloric uh, foundations? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the two kind of things evolved slightly independently. Um, so I knew I wanted to tell that particular story because it was something that kind of happened to me. Like it was a it was a, 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 it was a personal story that I I really wanted to tell. But I found that trying to tell it dramatically was kind of boring, or there was something just too. It, the minute I introduced the vampire element, I could access the story in, in a much more interesting way and and fun way as well um and it wasn't as because it, it it slightly deals with um you know the idea of drug addiction and and i was making a, a comedy so in a way the vampire element allowed me to take a, a serious subject and approach it in a way that was more accessible that's inter it's interesting you say that because uh, we we all know Dark Shadows, the uh, uh, the the famed soap opera uh, of the '60s, and uh, from from what I from what I've read and what I remember, uh, it started out as just a creepy soap opera, and one day Dan Curtis said, "You know what? It, we're going to get canceled soon if we don't do something. I'm going to put a vampire in this. What's the harm? We'll still get canceled." <laughs> okay. Well, I, uh, I wonder that how that worked out for him. Uh, so, so it's interesting that you say the, the 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 narrative was was better peppered by the vampire in that. And speaking of vampires, Chris, we have we have now heard about Dracula in this film and his relationship to Renfield. Now, your your work is so varied. First of all, uh, I, 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 my friends on Facebook, and so so one moment uh, it'll suddenly be there. He is. He's working on Terminator. Now he's working on Doctor Who. Now he's working on Dracula. Now he has this myth, this story, this whatever. I'm like, wow, dude, stop. Have a nice tea. Uh, tell it now. Your Dracula also goes by that way. It's a relationship between Dracula and Renfield. Yeah. What made you go there? What made you yeah. go there as opposed to the brides um, or something stereotypical? We've we've gone we, uh, again. I don't like that term brides because nowhere is it mentioned or even intimated that Dracula's having some sort of relationship with these women. It's actually a, a you know it, it's the the relationship they have with Dracula. There's actually a fourth woman in the in the castle as well, according to Bram's notes that I've written about. That's coming out uh, in in the. Um, I don't like calling things sequel, but the continuation of the Dracula story that I've written with uh, Decker. And this but, is now you're with you're you're writing with Dacre Stoker, yeah, uh, the great grand nephew of Bram Stoker. Yes. So so talk about authentic right there. Talk about the modern and the myth. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're, you're doing this for legacy comics, yes. So well, there's a few there's a few things going on. So if I go back to uh, Renfield, because. You know, I'll I'll talk about your involvement with Renfield here as well, Jay. Uh, Renfield's a Renfield's a fascinating character for me because he met Dracula before uh, Jonathan Harker, uh, and I explore the backstory of this um, in one of the novels I've written, Dracula's Bedlam. Uh, we look at um, how Renfield uh, met Dracula. He was sent out by Hawkins Law Firm first. Now Renfield, I believe, came from a very strict Catholic family. Um, that's not just the Irish in me bringing that out, but I think he was also transgressive. I think he liked to go to pubs. I think he liked women, but he was scared of women. And his father disapproved of him uh, greatly. Um, he wasn't, he was a partner in the law firm, but he wasn't very well respected by his father. So he jumps at the chance to go to uh, Transylvania, meets Dracula. And I think Dracula becomes the father figure that he's always wanted. Uh, he's disappointed God, but he could never disappoint the godlike figure of Dracula. Uh, he, you know, the, the Catholic God says, "Thou shalt not." Dracula and his uh, the woman in this castle are very uh, permissive and allow him to transgress uh, conventional religious beliefs. And that is where 
that's why Renfield is obsessed with Dracula becomes he, he becomes God, father figure, all of those things that he really that he really needs and, and desires. Um, and there is a form of you know there's obviously a form of uh, insanity that starts to uh, that starts to creep through. Um, the work I've done with Legacy Comics is a form of prequel um, to Dracula. And we decided to base Renfield on Jay himself here. <laughs> uh, if you go on Facebook, you'll see Jay's avatar is actually Renfield. Um, but yeah, so, so Jay's got a, an intimate link now to Dracula's legacy for 120, the 125th anniversary this year. Uh, so yeah, Renfield's, Renfield's a, a, a very important character um, within the Dracula mythos. Uh, you know, Dracula himself... If you look at the novel, uh, he comes out with a lot of varied descriptions of where he comes from. His history is, oh, he, he comes from gypsy stock, he comes from this, he comes from that. Vlad III was never intended to be uh, to be the central uh, figure of Dracula. Bram basically was told by his uh, editor, you have to go and find a, pro a name for this book. Dracula's original title uh, and a name was actually Count de Ville. Dracula is supposed to be the personification of the devil on earth. That's exactly who he is. Um, so there was a bit of a convoluted backstory created. Um, so when I look at Dracula, I, I, it's just get, I think it's just been published today. I've written an origin story for Dracula and it all begins with the death of God. I wonder if I'm allowed to say more than that. Um, the, the, the figure that becomes known as Dracula has existed for a very long time. Um, and I link him to Longinus, or Longinus who, uh, who pierces the side of Christ. Um, and there's a reason for that, because Christ is a solar deity. And this is when the sun then disappears. We have that that fantastic you've got with, with christ you've got a fantastic solar deity figure that, that you can use in dracula mythology because he's crucified on a, on a on a cross which is basically the symbol of the equinoxes and when he dies then the sun disappears and then you have all the christological links to vampirism um, as well and vampirism is older than christianity because you have uh, isis was uh, the goddess isis she was um, she was a vampire in the form of a Sitka. Um, so yeah, a Hefor, the, the goddess Hefor, whenever Ra was angry with mankind, he um, cast Hefor into the, the form of a lion, and the lion consumed man until man cried up to the heavens and asked Ra to stop. Then Ra fermented beer and made it like the color of blood and placed it in front of Hefor. She drank the beer, fell asleep, and Ra transformed her back. That's the origin of beer as well, allegedly. I still think Guinness is the origin of beer, but you know. <laughs> I'm uh, agreeing with you there. Yeah, my, my lovely wife has just appeared with some Guinness for me, so that's, that's what's brought that to my head. Oh, you need you need your blood of life for, for this interview. Very good. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's interesting just with Dracula there, I don't know if you, if you know, but the, the word Dracula in, in Irish, Druk, Ola means yeah. bad blood in the translation in, in Irish. Yeah. I mean, there's a link to the cholera epidemic as well, that Charlotte Stucker wrote about in her diaries. Yeah. And I, there's a graphic novel I've written um, using her diaries. It's coming out uh, August time, I think. Um, and we do have a scene there where you actually see through the... Because it was hell. It was a, it was a literal hell in, in Sligo. Where you just had the big, you had big drums of of uh, pitch and sulfur burning. You had, you had carts just picking up bodies, and the theory is, according to the Sligo uh, Dracula Society, that um, the carts that would have been used to carry the bodies were actually used by Bram Stoker um, as as uh, as the visual representation of Dracula's carriage. So there's a scene where. The carts are coming forward, and then Charlotte Stoker looks back, and sort of through the smog and the pitch, then you have Dracula's carriage coming, and then it transforms back again. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot more of Ireland and Dracula than than has ever really been explored, and that that that's part of my work uh, with with Dracula, not just fictionally, but the factual 
look at Dracula is to reclaim that heritage and really to be honest to reclaim Bram's place and the Stoker family's place in Dracula um you know the original Dracula is very has rarely been seen uh, we've got all interpretations of Dracula and I always say to you know there, there's various games coming out in the Stokerverse uh, RPG games and stuff and I remember talking to the, the game companies and they would say oh we don't want to do another Dracula and I said but you've never seen the original Dracula you know did you know that Dracula has hairy hands uh, and I'm not going to segue into a father Ted joke here but yeah Dracula actually does have hairs in the palms of his hands he's a grotesque person Dracula is not an erotic love story it never was he wasn't coming to London for a booty call he was coming to London because it was the center of the empire and he wanted to take over yep. um he he targets very specifically targets uh you know the, the woman there because he's issuing Lucy he's issuing a challenge to Van Helsing because Van Helsing's backstory is his wife was put in, a, in an asylum due to Dracula. Um, and he issues a challenge. Uh, he texts Lucy because he knows the, the connections that Lucy has. He knows that Sarah's going to call Van Helsing in. And Van Helsing in his hubris says, oh, yes, I will be able to save her. And Dracula knows that he can't. And when Lucy dies and is about to be transformed, um, <clears throat> he, know, he knows that Van Helsing has to ask of his friends two horrible things. One, he, they ha he has to desecrate Lucy's spirit. He says, by the way, that girl that you loved, she's now running around stealing kids and turning them into God knows what. And secondly, the desecration of her body. Right, we're going to have to stick her through a heart, cut her head off and stick garlic in her. God knows. Uh, you, you, you've sparked a, 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 a major thought with me, both of you, in, in talking about this. Firstly, yes, I didn't know... Uh, Dracula in, in, in Gaelic means bad blood. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, in, in Vlad, Vlad Chepesh, who, who supposedly was, was the real life Dracula for lack of a better term, uh, they called him Vlad Dracul and Dracul meant devil. So all of this, this religion, if you will, brings up a point and I'm, I'm, I'm figuring genteel ways of saying that when we talk mythology, we have to talk Christianity also. Uh, and, and I'm going to, to uh, a semi-authority here, the gentleman that was going to be a preacher before he became, uh, before he became a, a, a master of this genre. Bill, uh, when we talk about, now, now where you came from, I gather, was a very Christian area. I gather it was, it was heaped in religion, your particular area. Would you say so? Yeah. Okay. Um, how does that play in your characterizations and how does that play in the genre in general? Uh, we're hearing this desecration of God's work, uh, the notion of combining the pagan thoughts of the sun with the Christian thoughts of the son of God. Um, where does that come in in terms of mythology, do you think? Where does it come in in terms of creating the, the genre works that we've seen? comes in beautifully and it should come in more. Um, I often say that I think everybody would follow Jesus if it weren't for Christians. Sometimes I say if it weren't for the damn Christians. And what I mean is that modern expressions of Christianity and of Christ have stripped out all of the metaphor. And the metaphor is the power. The metaphor is the frame our relationship with metaphor determines how much peace we'll have on this earth and how much hell we'll bring other people if we don't have a relationship with metaphor. Um, yes, yes, and yes, that's my answer to your question. Um, it's all metaphor, Jay. It's all poetry. Poetic understanding is not my understanding of these glasses and this thing I can touch. Poetry is metaphor. It's something standing in for something else without that life doesn't have any purpose, any beauty, and it's not very entertaining either. <laughs> someone someone uh, made a comment once that the a picture of the of a galaxy, the way it swirls, looks exactly like water going down a drain. So so when you're talking about reality and metaphor, uh, it's right yeah. there. 
there, there, there is, there is math in the universe. There is math within cells. There are rules that are followed throughout many forms down to the cellular level. There, there's form, there's order. Um, but if you don't have that and you can't see, oh, the picture of the galaxy looks like the water. If you can't let your mind take you poetically for the connections, then life for you becomes a series of chaotic events and you become angry, rageful, and bitter. And if you have a personal computer in your pocket that can communicate your rage and anger to anyone in the world at any time, that, my friend, that is a recipe for hell on earth. And so that's why I'm such a disciple for metaphor and for folklore and for ambiguity for not being so certain that our point of view is the point of view but being open to the poetry of other people's points of view and other people's lives now how does all of this relate to horror it relates to death right because death has no meaning if we have not lived fully and horror is not about anything but death and how we deal with death. Excuse me, you got me preaching. <laughs> as, as Mark Twain said, forgive me for preaching, it's just that I never hear any preachers do it. Brilliant. I, you, you had once said uh, at another interview that you, uh, uh, you were almost a preacher. You almost became yeah. a preacher. Okay, I well. did, I, uh, that was my first ambition, and it was because these stories, Ray Bradbury and the New Testament saved my life together because both of them opened up worlds to this strange misfit child who didn't want to live anymore because I, I felt so alienated from everything. And suddenly here were these beautiful poetic worlds in which I could live worlds as expansive as uh, the parables of Jesus and the parables of Ray Bradbury. I don't see any, uh, um, uh, um, any discomfort uh, as Ray himself did not. In, in bringing these things together. Um, but, I, it, but it saddens me that we don't think poetically and we're so eager to set up divisions. It's, it's, it's not only unhealthy for us as a species, it's killing the planet and it's killing our souls. And it's making, I, I commend these, these panelists, you hear these beautiful movies that they're making that do have poetry, that do have metaphor, they do have real relationships um, because a lot of horror now, particularly the, the higher up you go in budget level, the more it's cookie cutter marketing. That's not what horror ever was about. Is that why you like the monsters? You said you, you like the monsters. Now, I know you have a, a deep affection for Lon Chaney Sr. Yes, that's Lon back there. Indeed. Uh, you, you... There's De Niro as the Frankenstein monster. Um, I was raised in an era when there was a resurgence of uh, monsters, famous monsters magazine and Fangoria and um, all of these great print magazines. I felt like a monster. And then I had an outlet because I saw these monsters and I could identify with them. I loved the monsters. Uh, I loved werewolves. I used to go up at night and climb up a tree and howl as loudly as I thought I could without waking the neighbors. Because I wanted to know what it felt like for them. And now I grow up and I find out that everybody's a damn monster. We're all monsters, but we don't want to admit it. And that's the disease of the world. But thank God we have diseases of the world or we wouldn't have horror movies, right? There you go. <laughs> uh, you, you bring up a fascinating point. The moment something is called truth, then there's a lie. If you don't say this, then you're lying. And, and as long as we're open-minded and understand the, the parable, as you say, the correlations, uh, we're able to, we're, we're not going to point the finger so fast. We're, we're, we're gonna say, really? What do you mean? And that's, that's called connection, that's called community. Uh, uh, it, it's no longer, uh, it's, it's, no, it's no longer, wait a minute, that's not true. So, so you make a really valid point. Now, I'm asking a huge question. I'm going to put our two filmmakers on the spot here. Something tells me they want you because, Bill, during your, 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 uh, your comments, Kate was nodding like this. I thought <laughs> the phones were going to pop off her. And the smile on Connor's face, 
It was at the edge of his screen. It was, I don't know what to do. So I'm asking our two filmmakers here. We're talking Christianity. We're talking religion. Let's just not say Christianity. Let's say religion. We're talking religion. Uh, did both of you at any point question putting what you have in your films? Was there ever that kind of thing? I, was your minds always open or was there that moment where you say, okay, this is what I was taught. I, I gotta, I gotta step around it. Um, I think in Ireland we have obviously like a very conservative Catholic, Irish Catholic upbringing, both me and I was literally bringing that up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a, the interesting thing about Ireland though, as well as I think there's such a connection to the kind of pagan that came before the, the kind of Catholicism, um, as well, that, you know, you never feel there's always something else there, something more unknown, a different set of beliefs that are underneath the uh, Catholicism and the Catholicism has definitely waned over, uh, recent years, especially probably for me and Connor's generations. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's always there. I think I was uh, at the film festival with, um, I was just at, I was uh, talking to Paco Plaza who made rec movies and uh, his new movie La Abuela and Veronica. And he said he kept as a, somebody who's brought up in Spain in Catholicism, he found himself always going back to nuns and the kind of set of beliefs you were taught as well. Um, I think it's always going to be with you. You'll always have that kind of Catholic guilt for exploring things in your films. But I think the, in my heart anyway, the paganism is always kind of trumps that. Um, and those kind of sets of beliefs, like in Ireland, when there was high Kings, there was, um, you know, Brehan law, which, which favored the women as much as men, there was much more equality before kind of the more patriarchal, systems of religion came in and women could divorce their husbands they could own land they could you know they were seen as very equal to their male um male counterparts and you know that's a life you know that i would like to relate to more than the kind of irish catholicism that was you know in my youth um and even just the kind of sense of community from that kind of pagan era as well i know bill was very much talking about kind of us getting divided and I think that there's a lot of like loneliness in life now, especially with COVID and everything. And I think when you're kind of in this little box on your, in your hands, you kind of forget the community and, and you remember like in Irish, in Irish history and, and around the times of those Celtic Kings, they had Shanachies because people couldn't necessarily read. So there was a storyteller who would tell stories and that's kind of like a very communal way of experiencing storytelling and, and um, stories that will help us make sense of life and ourselves. And I think that's how, like, you know, I always equate that to like being a storyteller now. It's like you're, you want to bring people together and like horror movies bring people all together to have a communal experience. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just uh, what Bill was saying, it totally like uh, chimed with me. I felt like it, it, I totally agree with that. Completely. And, and, and your last line is perfect. Uh, what better what better thing to do when we all get together but to scream? Yes. Uh, Connor, you looked so serious when Kate was talking. Tell us about, <laughs> about your your Irish Catholicism and and throwing and, and a vampire film behind it. What's uh, how do you feel? Is there is there Catholic guilt in you doing all of this? It's interesting. Like like Kate said, the hold of Catholicism isn't as, as much as it was, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And it is interesting how these two things do live side by side. Like like my mother would have said, you know, you know, the night before her mother died, she heard the wail of the banshee. And and at the same time, she'd be going to church and being very religious. So it, 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 it's interesting how these two things don't kind of contradict each other or, or did live side by side, you know. Um, uh, for me in this particular film, yeah, I think the, 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 I didn't really explore the religious aspect, to be honest, like, um, I know with vampires, there was always that symbol of I, what I always sort of resonated with, with that idea, the symbol of the sun as the, the, the destroyer of the, you know, the, the fact that the vampires are repelled by the sun and, and the image of the sun was quite, a, um, I guess you could say it's a symbol for God, but um, 
also uh, it's quite a pagan symbol you know when i think of i mean my earliest sort of connection with with those pagan kind of films i suppose is the wicker man um in terms of what inspired me and i remember i i i walked in and it was on telly and i was must have been about 10 and i was shooed out of the room and 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 i was like what what was the film and, and my dad said it's the wicker man and like i didn't know what the film was about but it's just the name the wicker man was in my head for years just me just trying to imagine like i thought it was some kind of worth of gummage scarecrow or maybe it was um but uh but yeah it was, it was just uh that 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 film definitely in terms of folk film was 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 really good uh, in in a way, I I, I envy you all. Uh, I I was brought up religious Jewish. Okay, well let, let's not go into that. But uh, th th there are very few Jewish monsters. I was so happy to to learn of the golem and things like that, just because I wanted to see the the other side, if you will, of of my own faith. So uh, uh, so it's really interesting that you have these two very distinct sides that. Uh, that that are there now 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 tracing to to Bill's comment and even something that that uh, Chris had mentioned we're talking about uh, we're talking about Christianity and there is a sense of I know of no other way to say this truth or reality to what you are taught within religious beliefs uh, and yet uh, when you talk pagan and when you talk uh, when you talk mythology and folklore it's supposedly not true. Uh, do you feel, and this is this is the last question I'll ask you, uh, are they real? Mythology, folklore, uh, whether whether it's the story of the Gorgon, whether it's the story of the we people, whether it's you have to tie a red ribbon around a baby's crib to stop the evil eye, all of this, is there a level of reality to it? I think it's subjective. And I think anything other than taking it as subjective is very dangerous. Um, is, are they real? No. Are they real? Yes. Anything you can create and anything you can understand in your head is completely real. Uh, Bill was talking about, you know, uh, about the metaphor, about the poetic metaphor. Uh, and, and that's the essence of spirituality. That's the essence of story itself. Um, you know, I don't look at religion like paganism and christianity go back to bram bram's works from dracula to lair of the white worm were all about this um this conflict between christianity and paganism and bram was somebody who was he, he was quite open to to all those ideas but i i also don't believe in the supernatural if there is a god it's the most natural thing in the universe so therefore it's not supernatural um pagan paganism I mean, that's just about, you know, that's village folk belief. That's what the, the, the term means. Uh, I think I think it's all one. I think all I think belief's one, but I think it's very subjective. It's just my opinion, but that's that's what I believe. I, I like that. So you're saying it's not necessarily, you know, it's not a flesh and blood reel, but it's a reel that if you believe in it hard enough, then yeah, I mean, I, when I when I took a job with Neil Gaiman, Neil interviewed me and said. Chris, how many gods do you think I believe in? And my answer was, as many as you can fit into, into your head. And he gave me the job. Because that's that's the truth. That is literally what it is. We live with many gods, and many demons, many things that exist within our heads. And, you know, as, as they talk about in the Gita, the true battlefield is always the battlefield of the mind. Kate, you've been nodding as much for Chris as you were for Bill, so I ask you, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I think if we get into a world where we try to explain everything and have an answer for everything, and, it, you know, we live in a very kind of world where there's kind of an overload of information explaining everything to you constantly, and I think um, you lose a bit of humanity. I think there's I think life is much more beautiful when there's things that you can't explain. And I think, you know, no matter how many Mark Zuckerbergs there are in the world making us have all kinds of apps on our phones and that kind of thing, like none of those people will ever be able to explain what happens when somebody passes away or dies and where do they go and what happens? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I think the unknown of the world is so important. Um, and just makes it much more beautiful. And I think 
that you know that make us feel connected and I think just like those kind of things are so important and yeah we shouldn't uh say whether things are real or not because for some people they're very real and I think that's that's I agree with Chris on that respect as well it's interesting you make a very powerful statement there uh, uh the artist is really the scientist because the unexplainable is turned into a film a novel a, a stage play etc to explain it and while it's it's it could be different uh it's we we it is up to us to to explain the unexplainable uh connor how about you uh real these myths real well the way i think about it is like you know whether i believe in say fairies or you know fairy trees and you know i might say mm, i don't know if i believe but i definitely am not going to cut one down you know and it's like that thing where <laughs> i don't know if i believe but i i believe enough that i'm not going to tempt faith you know and it's interesting because in ireland you know they've diverted motorways around fairy rings and fairy trees or and another thing I saw was a house with three doors. And I was like, why is there three doors in that house? And they, the, basically the house was built between two fairy forts. And they, they wanted to leave a door on either side in case the fairies were coming through, you know. And it's, it's, it's like this thing where, um, uh, like the guys were saying, it's, it's, it's a better world when there's still some sense of that. And, and, and it's something you can't put into words. It, it's a connection with, with the, the unknown, with the unexplained. And, and, and that can't ever be written down or it can't ever be captured. It, it's, you know, it's something to be experienced. Uh, and, right. and you can do that if, you've, if you journey to the Irish countryside. <laughs> Quite easily. Um, uh, Bill, take us home. Uh, you talked about howling in a tree. Okay, when we look up in the stars, when we stare at a grave, when the sun goes down and it's pitch black outside, what's real? What's real out there? T.S.T. Naritia, what is truth? It, it matters to me much less that a thing is fact than that it is truth, right? I, I don't really care if there was a Garden of Eden, but I do care about temptation, which is not the fact of the Garden of Eden, but it is the truth. And the same is true for uh, uh, our mythologies and our folklores, I think. So um, I'm, I'm not very useful or interesting in a discussion on whether the earth is made in seven days. I really don't give a damn, but, but I am very interested and what we do with the time that we have here. And, and again, Jay, you know, I come back to death. Um, as it was said so beautifully just a moment ago that no matter how much technology we have, it cannot explain this final mystery. Last year, I held a, a beautiful dog of 15 years, a wonderful life in my hands as the vet administered the the uh, drugs that took him out of his misery. And I looked into his eyes as I had looked into his eyes when he was born. <laughs> and I know it's only a dog, but I don't have children. And, you know, I was there for the entire journey. And at the moment that I looked into his eyes and those eyes rolled back and his head lolled back and my head lolled forward so I could be looking in his eyes every moment up until that last something happened poetry happened something happened that cannot be explained by any damn app and i don't want any app to try to explain it we must have the moments of transcendence because that's what we're all longing for is to transcend this pile of steaming technology that we <laughs> that we're forced to live in it's the poetry it's the poetry thank you uh, i i i i'm just gonna say i'm i'm a dog lover and had one for for 13 years so so been there been there um and and something tells me everyone else understands that uh, on their own levels as well 
Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to thank you very much. Um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, when talking about actors, uh, makes the comment, he calls them the abstract and brief chronicle of the time. You had uh, better have a bad epitaph than their ill report. Well, I'm sure I'm paraphrasing slightly, but it's from Hamlet. Um, and that is what you all do. Yes, the scientist tells us exactly what that molecule is. They, they, they pinpointed the disease that, that made Zoom the stock to buy. Uh, or StreamYard, uh, or or any of these, uh, but it is you. It is you, the priests of the art. It is you who speak these words, who write these words, who who uh, uh, commit these words to film and to light. Uh, that that look up to the stars. That look at a graveyard and say, now what goes on behind there? There's a great line from an, from a play where uh, an atheist is chatting with. With a very religious man and and he says how can you believe in that there's no truth to it he says so what i'm not going to know until i get there and then no harm done so so i think uh, i think all of you are saying the same thing okay let's 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 step out into the stars let's step out into into the fairy tree let's step in front of the fairy tree and and find the reality uh, or at least our version of it um uh, kate and connor thank you so much for joining us. I wish you all the best with Boston Sci-Fi uh, and and may your films be absolutely marvelous. Uh, please feel free to send me screeners. I would love I would love to make sure people review this and all of that. Uh, Dr. Chris McCauley and Bill Oberst Jr. As always, gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speak to you. Your your breadth of knowledge in this topic and beyond is uh, is is universe is is should be should be taught in schools. Uh, I know I always come away uh, a better man for having spoken to both of you. Thank you all very much, and thank you Boston Sci-Fi for uh, for going where no one has gone before. This is not a panel about how the head fell off somebody in a movie or what they did to glue on the fangs. This is this is uh, about the depth of this topic and what makes it so enduring. Uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Boston Sci-Fi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.